right, jumping into uh, lesson 6.2, uh, a little more fun with vectors. So first thing we're going to take a look at is how do you multiply two vectors together? So um, we're going to take a look at the first one together, and then we're going to fill in the second one. So as you look at this first guy, so if I want to multiply vector u times vector v, here is the idea behind it. It's the same way you would multiply matrices together. Uh, we find their matching components. So I want to multiply the horizontal component times the other horizontal component. I want to do the same thing with the verticals. And then we add the results, right, to become one number at the end of it. So uh, they, they call this finding the dot product. That's just sort of the name of it. Obviously, product means multiply. So uh, when we do the dot product on this and we multiply on the first one, they would have done 3 times 2 plus 1 times negative 5. And then they simplify the results. So you can see that one worked out right here. So they started out by the 3 times 2 plus the 1 times negative 5. Um, clean that up and we get a result of 1. So the product on this was 1. So let's try one of those together. So if you look at B, uh, and we're going to multiply this vector times this vector. So we're going to start with the horizontal components, 5 times negative 4. We're going to add that to the product of the vertical components, so 4 times 5. So if we did a little cleanup on that, of course, make sure you're considering order of operations when you do this. I got negative 20 here, I got positive 20 here. So if we clean that up, these guys have a dot product of 0. Um, and that is significant. We'll talk about that later on in this lesson. Um, before we move on to the next part of this, uh, I just wanted to mention, if you do get something that's not in component form, but rather in the I and J form like this one is, uh, don't forget it's really no different, right? This is still the horizontal component is negative 2 and positive 3. The verticals are positive 2, negative 5. If you wanted to, you could always rewrite it to look like this in component form, if that makes you feel better uh, about the process, but really no different when they put it in I and J form rather than component form like this. So that idea of dot products is now going to get used within this formula right here. So the next thing we're taking a look at is if I have two vectors, so here's vector U going off this direction. Right here we have vector V going off this direction. Um, obviously when you put their initial points together at the same starting point, um, it does create an angle between those two vectors. So our goal on this one is to figure out what that angle is. So we do have a formula for this that I've circled kind of right here. So you can see within that formula, uh, we are doing a dot product, right? So that's the numerator of this would be to multiply the two vectors together. And that's how you get the numerator. The denominator is to multiply their magnitudes together. So uh, don't forget the little absolute value bars represents magnitude. So I need to figure out the magnitude of both vectors and multiply those magnitudes together in order to get the denominator. Um, at the end of this, ultimately we are trying to find an angle, so don't forget the way we always do that is to use an inverse trig function. Okay, and so this is always a cosine function. So at the end of all this, once we do the dot product to get the top, once we multiply their magnitudes to get the bottom, then we are going to do the inverse cosine of that fraction in order to get the angle between the two vectors. So this is what it looks like. Well, let's try one of those. So the one I chose from this was the one that had the I and J form. Uh, again, just to kind of show you that it really doesn't matter what form those are in. Um, do keep in mind if they only have the letter I sitting there. So that just says I plus square root of 2 times J. Uh, if there's only the letter I, then technically that represents a value of 1, right? So uh, it's not 0. It's, if, if it was 0, there wouldn't be a letter there at all, right? It would only be this. Uh, but because there's an I there, it represents a value of 1. So really what we're seeing on this is a component form of 1 rad 2. And what we're seeing on this one is a negative rad 2 and a negative 4. So let's just start with the, the numerator portion of this. We've got to find their dot products. So again, I am going to multiply the 
horizontal components together. So if I did 1 times negative rad 2, I just get negative rad 2. I want to add that to their vertical components. Negative 4 times rad 2 is negative 4 rad 2. And uh, we can add those together because they're both rad 2. So think of this as negative 1 plus negative 4. That would make this negative 5 square root 2. So we now have the numerator of our setup, right? This is the value that goes on top. Um, on bottom, we're going to need to put their magnitudes. So don't forget how we do the magnitudes. In fact, let me set this up over here. So I'm going to start creating our setup of our answer. So we figured out the numerator. We need to multiply the two magnitudes together to get the denominator. So we learned last lesson how you find the magnitude, right? It's basically distance formula, which stems from Pythagorean theorem. Uh, so on this one, on the first one, uh, vector u, we're going to do the square root of a squared plus b squared. So that's how we find the magnitude. That's going to go here. We're going to multiply that by the magnitude of this one. Let's just identify what this is. So this is 1 plus uh, rad 2 squared would just be 2. So 1 plus 2 is 3. So I know that rad 3 is the magnitude of the first one. And let's do that with this guy as well. So if I did again a squared, which would just be 2, plus b squared, which would be 16, I'm going to get the square root of 18. Now, if you wanted to, you could multiply those together um, and, and bring it under one radical. There's nothing wrong with that. Not really necessary because all this is going in our calculator anyway. So uh, we could just do it in one shot. So remember, we're going to do the inverse cosine of this in order to get the angle. And we do typically do this in degrees. So I want to make sure I'm in degree mode here. So let's take our inverse cosine, set up that big ugly fraction. So I'm looking at negative 5 root 2 on top. And then rad 3 times rad 18. On bottom. So here it is in the calculator. And there's our answer. So about 164.2 degrees would be the angle between those two vectors. All right, let me jump down to this next one. So for this one, we are looking at uh, the projection of one vector onto another. So what we're going to see on this one is here is vector u, here is vector v. We are trying to find the resultant, if we were to project this vector onto this vector. Um, so I really liked this example as a way of looking at it, because I thought this made it pretty clear. So if you think of vector u, so this is the same diagram, but I've added a couple things here. So think of vector u as this one right here, and vector v as this guy going sort of up in the air and vector v being flat on the ground right so if the sun was shining directly above the terminal point of vector v right it's going to cast a shadow onto vector v this is the projection right so this shadow that would be cast from this vector onto this one is what we call the projection of vector u onto vector v so I thought that was a pretty good way of looking at it. Kind of paints a little better picture. Uh, but the idea that we're going to look at is <clears throat> if I'm trying to figure out this vector, we'll notice that it does run the same direction as vector v. Right? It's just a smaller portion of vector v. It's like a fraction of vector v. So because it runs the same direction as vector v, uh, it, it basically is a scalar multiple of vector v. Right? It's taking vector v and it's multiplying it by some fraction smaller than 1 in order to create 
this guy right here. So let's look at the formula for this. Uh, so again, it doesn't have the same length as u or v, as we can see that in the diagram that we were just looking at. So it doesn't have the same magnitude, uh, but it does run the same direction as vector v. So therefore, it makes it just simply some scalar multiple of that vector, right? Because it's going the same direction. It's just a shorter version of vector v. Could be a longer version too. Uh, but in this case, with the drawing that I gave you, it's a shorter version of vector v. So it is some fraction of vector v. In other words, it's some scalar multiple of v. So if I can figure out vector, take a look at vector v, and if I can figure out what the scalar is, I simply multiply that scalar times vector v in order to get the resultant, right? the, the projection that we're looking for. So here's the way that you write this. So we're looking at the, pro the projection of vector u onto vector v. Right? So ultimately, we are looking for what is that scalar, and we want to multiply it times this vector right here. So here's the formula, real similar to the formula that we just did. Right? I have their dot product on top, and I am multiplying two magnitudes together on bottom, but the issue is we are not doing the magnitude of u times v. We're just doing the magnitude of v times v. Okay, so it's, it's just a slight change in the formula that we were just looking at when we were talking about the angle between two vectors. Uh, so this is the setup for that. Uh, this is our scalar. And once we figure out what that scalar is, I can multiply it times vector v, since that's the one it is being projected onto in order to figure out what the resultant is. So here's that formula. Hang on to that. We're going to look at the example on the previous page. So take a look at this first part with me. Okay, so here is vector u, here is vector v. We are going to project this one onto this one. Here was the formula that we just talked about. So again, this is the projection of u, of u onto v. So the, the one that is down here is like the subscript, is the one that is being projected onto. Okay, and so that's the one that needs to go here within our formula and here, right? So this would change if I flip those letters, right? That would alter this one as well as this guy. So again, all they did was take the dot product of those guys. That's what went on top. They figured out the magnitude of vector v and squared it. That's what went on bottom. So this is my scalar, three-fourths. So uh, the result is three-fourths of vector v. So I'm simply going to distribute the three-fourths. So we're going to multiply it times the six to get the new uh, horizontal component. We're going to multiply it times the two to get the new vertical component. And that's it. This would be the projection vector of u onto vector v. So that's all we're seeing on that one. So not too bad of a formula. Come down here with me. Let's do a little work together. So take a look at 24 with me. So for this one, I not only want to show you just sort of the work with the formula, but I also wanted you to get a clear picture of how this works. Um, so if you look at vector u, if its horizontal is negative 4 and its vertical is negative 3, that means from 0, 0, it went left 4, left 4, and down 3. So here is the terminal point of vector u. If I did the same thing with v, negative 6, negative 2, so negative 6, negative 2. So here is the terminal point of vector v. So in terms of, if I just wanted to get a visual idea of what this projection looks like, all I have to do is follow this step right here. Uh, just like I showed you with my uh, beautiful diagram on the other page that had the sun shining over and we're talking about the shadow. So that's the way you draw these, is you take the, the one that is being projected onto the other, you go to its terminal point, which is right here, and you want to draw a line that is perpendicular to right there to the other line. Okay, so if this is my terminal point of vector u, I want to draw a line, the shortest line possible to vector v, which would be perpendicular to vector v. So something right about here. 
would be the shortest line possible. So I'm drawing that perpendicular line right there. So the idea is this from there to there is going to be our projected vector, right? So from zero, zero, let me see if I can give this a better color. From zero, zero to that point right there is going to be our projected vector. So when we use the formula to find this projected vector, so we're doing u onto v, right? What we're finding is the component form of this red vector, right? That's what we're finding, right? It's kind of like, again, it's kind of like if the sun was right here, shining straight down to the ground, it would cast this shadow that we're seeing in red. <clears throat> Let's try the formula. So again, real similar to the formula we've already used. I want their dot product on top. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'm going to do uh, negative 4 times negative 6 plus negative 3 times negative 2. And that gives me their dot product. Um, on bottom, I need the magnitude of the vector that is being projected onto. So we are going onto vector v, so I need to know the magnitude of vector v. So I'm just looking at those numbers right there. I'm going to do my little uh, a squared plus b squared. So a squared plus b squared. And I get this look right here. So, so remember for this, uh, that this is the magnitude squared. I should have written that before I wrote this. So that's always going to cancel out the radical, right? And so that's why we're getting 30 over 40, which again, you could obviously reduce to 3 fourths. So what that tells me is this is the scalar that I am now to multiply times vector v. So I'm now multiplying 3 fourths times vector v, which was my negative 6, negative 2. And again, all that means is I'm going to distribute that to each component. So if I did 3 fourths times 6, uh, let's see, what would that give us? 2, 3, 9 over 2. So I'm going to get negative 9 over 2. For the new horizontal component, and I'm going to get, so if we distribute here, that becomes 2, 1, so 3 over 2. Negative 3 over 2 would be my vertical component. So now if you take a look at this, this was negative, let's just put decimals for a minute. So negative 4.5 and negative 1.5. So let's see how that looks on our drawing. So if I go negative 4.5, which would be right there, and then down 1.5, I'm pretty close. I'm not using graph paper. Uh, I'm pretty close. So uh, what I'm seeing is that should land me on the terminal point of that red vector. All right, so that's what we just came up with is the, the components of this terminal point right here of the red vector, our projection. So I want to look at something out of your book with you. Examples uh, 6 on page 463. So here's like a really good look at a sort of an application problem uh, to projecting vectors onto each other. Uh, so we have <clears throat> Juan sitting right here on the sled, getting ready to go down the hill. Um, however, uh, Rafaela um, is to keep the sled from sliding down the hill. So you got Rafaela right here in yellow, uh, pulling back on this uh, rope right here to keep the sled from moving. So right now, he's at a standstill at the top of this hill. So obviously, uh, we have two forces at work here. This is a great physics problem. Uh, we have the force pulling the sled down the hill. And we have Raffaella with the opposite force pulling back to keep the sled from moving. So there's two forces at work here, and they are opposite forces uh, keeping this guy from moving down the hill. So the question there being asked is, what force is she pulling at in order to keep this from moving? Right. So if we look at the hill, obviously the hill we could write as a vector, right? Because it has a horizontal component and it has a vertical component. So we have a vector that is the hill, and we have gravity, the force of gravity, being projected onto the hill. 
right? So that, there's our projection statement, basically, right? Is we are taking this look right here. So F represents the force of gravity, which is the weight of this guy being pulled straight down. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, onto vector V, which vector V is the hill, right? That he's going to be sliding down. So we're going to project the force of gravity onto vector V, which is the hill. Uh, now, when you look at the force of gravity, gravity we know pulls straight down, right? So if the weight is 140 pounds, which they told us up here, if the weight's 140 pounds, then that represents the vertical component of the force of gravity because it pulls straight down towards the center of the Earth, right? So uh, there's our vector for the force of gravity. It only has a vertical component to it. And this vector is now being projected onto the hill. So here's the vector they came up with for the hill. Um, obviously, the cosine of 45, right? Remember, this has a horizontal, which goes this way, and a vertical, which goes this way. Since it's a 45 degree angle, the, the cosine, as we know, is our x value. So it's the cosine of 45 is going this way. That's our horizontal component. The sine of 45, which is our vertical component, would go this way. So they're writing that in component form like this. Um, and of course, we can plug in real numbers. We know cosine of 45 is rad 2 over 2. We know the sine of 45 is rad 2 over 2. So this is our vector for the hill. And so what we are going to be doing is projecting the force of gravity, which is this vector right here, onto vector v, which is the hill, which is that vector right there. So once, we, once we've identified those, that's the, like the hardest part of any word problem, right? It's just getting the setup. Uh, once we've identified those, the rest is exactly like what we just did. I'm going to get their dot product on top. I'm going to figure out the um, magnitude of the hill and square it on bottom. And then multiply it times the hill, vector v, because that's what it's being, that's what the force is being projected onto. Uh, now they did note on this one uh, that because this is a 45, 45, 90, uh, when you do the square root of a squared plus b squared, uh, you, of course, you just get a value of 1. So really, if this is a value of 1, it's not really needed in the formula in this case uh, because it's just a value of 1. It's not going to affect our answer. So we really could write it this way and do without the denominator if it's a value of 1. So they did the dot product, came out with negative 140 uh, times this. So that was our dot product. And they are going to multiply that by vector v. So the negative 70 rad 2 was the dot product. Right here is vector v. So they're simply going to distribute the negative 70 rad 2 to each of those components. And right here you see we get the resultant vector. Right. So this is the projection of gravity onto that hill. Would be this guy right here. So if we wanted to know the force, and I actually put this at the beginning of our very beginning of our notes for this whole chapter, uh, is when we talk about magnitude, all the things that magnitude can represent, force was one of the things I wrote on there. So uh, when they ask us for the force that is required for her to keep that sled from going down the hill, well, then I need to know the magnitude of this resultant vector. So if we do the magnitude of this, you come away with about 99. So 99 pounds is the force that she's having to exert to keep that sled from going. So there's just one example of the way this could work within like a, a word problem, like a physics problem like this one. Let me take you back to our notes for one last page. So take a look at this one with me. So let me introduce you to a new vocab word, orthogonal. Uh, orthogonal is the same thing as perpendicular. So if you have perpendicular vectors, again, we know that means these guys form a 90 degree angle. So if these guys are perpendicular, the, the vector vocab word for you is orthogonal vectors. Uh, so that's what we're looking for. So what do we know about perpendicular lines, right? If this is 90 degrees, what is the cosine of 90 degrees? Well, we know the cosine of 90 degrees is zero. So the idea is um, if I go through the process of finding the angle between the two vectors, just like we did a little earlier in this lesson, right? It was the dot product on top and the product of their magnitudes on bottom. Well, if we get zero as 
the result of this. Again, that's, that's saying the cosine of the angle is zero, right? So if I get a result of zero, when I take the final step and I do the inverse cosine of this number, well, if it's zero, the inverse cosine of zero is 90. So let me shorten that up for you. When we go through this process, I only need to get zero on top, right? Because zero divided by anything is still zero. So if I can get zero from just the dot product, I know that when I go to set up this process, it's going to give me a zero here. And then when I go to do the inverse cosine of that zero, I know it's going to be 90. So in short, if their dot product is zero, you know you have perpendicular lines, right? All because of the way it affects our formula for the angle between the two vectors. So right here, just filling in that blank, I just said the inverse cosine of zero is 90. So if you have two vectors that have a dot product of zero, then they must be perpendicular or orthogonal. I'm just going to do that to keep it short. All right, last thing. If a vector is a scalar multiple of another, then they are parallel vectors. They're parallel vectors. So here's what we're looking at on that. So if I have this vector and I have this vector, do you see how the 3 became 6 and the 5 became 10? Right? Like what would I multiply times those numbers in order to get those numbers? So if it's the same value that is being multiplied to both, then that means I simply took this vector, gave it a scalar multiple of 2, and this was the result. So therefore, if that is the case, uh, then I know 2 is the scalar, and I know these must be parallel vectors. They run the same direction. So the way you could always mathematically figure that out is by just sort of dividing. So if I took uh, the horizontal component and divided it by this horizontal, if I took the vertical and divided it by this vertical, um, it's, it's like I'm working backwards to figure out the scalar, right? What was multiplied? So when I divide backwards, if I get the same answer, right, that means the same number was multiplied times him as it was times him in order to get these numbers. Therefore, it was just a scalar, and therefore these guys must be running the same direction as each other. So therefore, they're parallel. So that is it for 6.2.